All right, thanks everybody for coming. I will start two minutes early because the room is full already anyway. So my name is Klaus Purer. Um, I've been a Drupal contributor for a long time and my specialty is code review. So I help new contributors um, when they publish the module, they have to go through this process called the security advisory <coughs> coverage process. And my screen just went out. Damn your screen saver. I hope it's back soon. Um, you can find me on Drupal.org under uh, Klausi. I was also part of the Drupal security team for a couple of years. I work for Tropico.com. We are a job board provider that is doing their technology based on Drupal. And yeah, during this process when I do the code reviews, I thought it would be a good idea to somehow give some examples what kind of stuff that I find so that you can also apply that when you review the code of your colleagues or code on Drupal.org, whatever. Um, what are the goals of the uh, of code review? What are we trying to accomplish? So we want to find problems before they hit production. So somebody is writing the code and then it would be a good idea if somebody is actually reviewing the code and making sure um, that nothing bad is in there. And that way we can prevent security vulnerabilities before they are exploited. So we are in the security process that is called the prevention phase. So before anything actually happens, we make sure that we prevent as much as possible. Code review is also a form of knowledge transfer. So um, the developer that is reviewing the code might know some things that the, the author of the code didn't know and they can point it out and that way that the code can be improved. And actually that's also a good opportunity for new people in your company or new contributors on Drupal um, to point them in, in the right direction how APIs should be used. And in the end, what do we want to do as companies? We want to save cost by preventing problems. We want to prevent bugs so that it's not embarrassing for us when clients detect those bugs. We want to catch them beforehand, but we also want to save costs um, and prevent a security breach, for example, or any vulnerability that would expose our data or compromise our data. Usually code review is done in pull requests, so that happens a lot on, on, on GitHub, but we also have the patch system uh, on Drupal.org and within your company, I don't, I don't know what you use, many companies also use pull requests. And the goal is one developer writes the code and the peer reviews the code and makes it better. All changes to Drupal core, for example, are peer reviewed and code reviewed. So before a change goes into Drupal, um, it has to be looked at by another contributor and then they approve it and then it gets committed by a core committer. So we're also doing that in, in Drupal already. So yeah, I structured my talk by giving just a couple of examples. Let's look at the typical Drupal 8 module uh, layout. In this example, I use the name pants, so we have some kind of pants module, not sure what it does. Um, <laughs> the typical files that you are seeing in this module is install files, module files, and then a couple of YAML files in, in Drupal 8 that contain your configuration. Um, what I look at first is the module file and the routing file, because when I first look at the module, I want to see the attack entry points. What can somebody do with the module? Where's the request coming in and where's the request handled and what problems uh, might we see there? Um, then I, I go through the controllers and classes and services that we have in the Drupal 8 module. And in the end, I want to know where the information goes out. So I would be looking at the, the tweak templates, um, pre-process functions, anything that uh, creates output in Drupal, render arrays, what they are doing. That's my typical process. Um, and in the end, I want to read through the whole code of the module. I think that's also important. It's not good if you review parts of a module. In the end, you should uh, just take a look at every file, what they are doing in there. Then you also better understand how they are interacting. So let's start um, with uh, routing. Routes are defined usually in the routing YAML files. You can also create dynamic routes in um, some dynamic route plugin. I'm not sure if it's a plugin. I think it's an event subscriber. But usually people do the do that in the routing YAML file. So this is where I look first. Um, incoming requests, they are mapped in these routing files to controllers. And here, for example, we have a pants controller in the source uh, folder. So that's first I look at the routing file, was it, what is defined there, and then the pants controller, what it is actually doing. Um, this is not the only um, attack entry points you can have in a Drupal module. So Drupal is also known to do a lot with events, plugins, and hooks. So those would be the next extension points that you would look at in a module after you are done with routing. All right, so let's take a look at this pants routing YAML file. Let's read through it. Um, the route has a name at the top, pants.admin. It exposes something at a pass called slash admin slash pants. And there is a form attached. It's the pants admin form. 
And in order to access that admin form, you have to have the permission um, access content and we define it as an admin route. So, mm, mm, not sure I like that. Um, any idea what might be wrong here? Access content. Yeah, access content is really a weird permission that shouldn't be, be here. So this would be an access bypass in a route. Um, I don't know what this admin form does, but just guessing from the name, I know already mm -mm, admin stuff, we don't use the access content permission. Uh, we need to probably use some other permission there, like administer pants, for example, if it's about the pants module. <laughs> some people also use like administer site configuration, which is the very uh, generic backend configuration permission in Drupal that is a bit overused. So better module defines their own admin permission and use that, but don't use access content for admin routes, for example. And um, I tried to map this a bit to the OVASP um, top 10 security vulnerabilities. OVASP is a project that collects risks, vulnerabilities, and how they can exploit it in this um, comprehensive documentation framework. It's the Open Web Application Security Project. And actually this would fall under the top five called broken access control. So some access control is broken and an attacker that has access content could actually change something on his admin form. Um, but I, I even see uh, even worse things. So in the requirements, if you spy, uh, specify underscore access true, it means everybody can access this, this uh, uh, admin form. Why do people do this? Why do I see this in code reviews so often? So people, um, they prototype with their module and they don't have a permission yet. And just for development, I will put in this access flag true and then later I will fix it. Of course, that later never happens and then this stays in a module and then the module might be deployed and then this is really dangerous because any attacker, actually any user can access this part and change uh, values in the form. Yeah, so that's, that's the second um, access bypass. Let's look a little bit more complicated example. Now we want to delete pants. So pants are some entity, some object in our Drupal system. We don't care actually for this example. And we have a delete path where I can specify an identifier of a path, for example, the number one, two, three, four, five, whatever the identifier of the, pants, the pant is. Then it goes through to the delete controller. We specify it in the controller here. Some uh, pants module is loaded and in the controller, as you see at the bottom, the pants are deleted. And then we show a success uh, message in a Drupal render array. So this looks good, right? What? What could possibly go wrong here? I see you raising a hand here. Any idea? Regular expressions? No. Regular expressions should be a problem here. So if you just pass an ID, um, that's not the point I want to make here. Any other guesses what might be wrong in, with this code? No confirmation step. Exactly. And what does no confirmation step mean? This is a cross-site request forgery uh, vulnerability in a route. So we're never confirming the user's intent here. You have to imagine if I just type in slash pants slash delete slash one in the browser um, and you do this as an admin, it will just go ahead and delete these pants without user confirmation. What do we do in, in Drupal to prevent that? And we use confirmation forms or tokens in the URL or the request. So how could an, an attacker exploit this? They uh, put together an image tag and instead of using an actual image in the source, they use this path to your Drupal site where they point to some specific um, pant they want to be deleted on your behalf. And that's actually also the root of the problem. The browser is doing something on your behalf. So you visit the attacker page and there is this image. And the image source fetches something from your page, from your Drupal site. And what the browser does, it also sends the session cookie along. So you are logged in as admin on your Drupal site. The browser fetches this image, sends the cookie along, and then something on a completely different site is just executed with a GET request, right? Because there is no, there is no form, there is no, no step in between. The pants just get deleted and then that is done. So the pants delete controller executes your callback and suddenly pants 5 are gone. You didn't, you didn't intend to do this, right? And that's why we need confirmation form in Drupal. When you delete the node, you get a confirmation form. When you do data changing um, actions in your Drupal code, then you need um, to confirm the user's intent. And another way to do that, um, sometimes you don't want the confirmation form because it's, not, uh, it's, it's bad for usability. If you're deleting something unimportant, uh, which we don't care about, then you might not want a confirmation form. Then you can use something called CSRF tokens. And Drupal 8 has some nice support for that. 
So you put this CSRF token property into your routing YAML file. So this is the same routing YAML file that, have, that we have seen before, except that we have added this uh, CSRF token entry. And we say true. And then we have a output a link to delete those pants. Such a uh, cryptographically secure token is appended. And this token um, has a different value per admin user. It has a different value per session. So the attacker cannot guess it. The attacker cannot um, put an image on their site and come up, ah, I will use this and this token, this will surely work. No, it is generated um, specifically for an administrator, so an, an attacker cannot um, recover it. Um, so if this token is missing, what happens then? Um, Drupal will, will return an access denied for this page. So this attack that we've seen before with the image wouldn't work anymore because, of course, at the end of the source here, the token is missing. And where do we use these tokens if we don't have a confirmation form? Um, so for example, the shortcut module in Drupal Core, you know it, you can create a little shortcut somewhere in the admin interface and then you can quickly jump to an, to an admin page. And if I delete such a shortcut, shortcut having a, a, a confirmation form would be a bit tedious. Yes, I really want to delete this shortcut. So although it is a data, data changing operation, right? I'm deleting something, I delete a shortcut, it's not that important. So even if the user clicks it by accident, then this is also executed and the shortcut is deleted. It's not a big problem because they can just quickly create a shortcut again. You would, you would never use such a CSIF token for a node, for example. Let's say you have huge blog articles with very important content to you. Then you wouldn't use this token because then a node would be deleted immediately. So you would rather use confirmation forms. So by default, always use confirmation forms for delete operations, for example. Or for your forms, when you edit the node, there's of course also forms because forms per default in Drupal are CSRF protected. So that's already built in. And if you do need something fancy for be better usability, there is this CSRF token helper, which only exists in Drupal 8. So in Drupal 7, you have to kind of um, do the CSRF token validation on your own. So Drupal 7 is not nice in that regard. Yeah, so a couple of Drupal 7 examples. So what we saw in the YAML files when you review a Drupal 7 module, this is basically one-to-one -one the same concept, except that it's in hook menu, which is defined in a module file. There, the routing is defined there. You have the title, page callbacks, and whatever. And as we saw before, the access content permission is wrong here again, because we are rendering an admin form, and it should have an, an adequate permission. Same for the access callback true. We have this in Drupal 8, we have this in Drupal 7. So when I look into a model, I always scan the routing parts if the developer forgot to set the access callbacks correctly. And then um, I can point out maybe a security vulnerability. So everything that we saw in Drupal 8 also applies here. And what I, when I review this, and maybe a developer does this on purpose, right? There might be a payment gateway which has to have an open access page callback because PayPal is calling back and PayPal always needs to have access. So we define it like that, so it would be actually correct. And then I tell developers, please leave a code command above it. So above the command, they should write a comment. Um, there is no access protection here because PayPal always needs to reach this page. And then the, rev the reviewer knows, aha, they did it on purpose and it's not an accident. We say we also have the same patterns for cost write re request forgery in Drupal 7. Um, routing is defined in hook menu again. And then we have some page callback which deletes something, pants in this example. And we also should uh, use confirmation forms here, same as in Drupal 8. Um, we don't have automatic CSRF tokens. So if I want to validate some token, I need, would have to do this myself in this page callback. A couple of contrib modules are doing that. I think you can even find it in Drupal 7 core. So you would, uh, you would um, copy this um, token generating and token validating code from there. All right. So uh, some attack entry points with routing summarized. In Drupal 8, you have routing YAML files, where I first look at. And then in the source folder, the controllers and the forms, they are important to me because those are things that um, an, an attacker potentially can directly reach. And in Drupal 7, the equivalent is hook menu and page callback in modular ink files. Um, so module files are always uh, important in Drupal 7 and in 8. So you should always review those. And as I said, check for access bypass with permissions, how the access handling is done, and also for cross-site request forgery. So whenever you see an action in a routing file, like delete something or change something, I immediately go checking, is this a confirmation form, is it just a controller? And then I already think, ah, there might be some CSRF uh, vulnerability here. <coughs> 
Now for something uh, different a bit. So we see this uh, method of a class. It gets a log item since some timestamp. And what the developer did here, they um, wrote a, a query with the database API, all is looking good. Um, they are writing a where query here, and then they execute this where query and return the results of stuff that they get from the database. SQL injection. Mm -hmm. SQL injection, I heard, yeah, correct. So whenever you see string concatenation, or whenever you um, see variables embedded in a string, which is related to database query, you shouldn't do that. Because what's the problem? So we are passing off information to another system, and this other system is the database. And we, to the database, we are sending instructions and we are sending data. But if we put the instructions and the data together, the database cannot distinguish anymore. Um, they just get the instructions and execute it. They, the database doesn't know what is coming from an attacker and what has been done by the developer. Um, so this is one of the top risks in the OWASP top 10. It's actually number one because it's, so, it's a high risk. It can happen often. People often get it wrong. Um, called injection. It doesn't only apply to SQL injection. There are also other injection vulnerabilities. And yeah. So whenever you see string concatenations or var variables embedded in a string, that's a code smell that um, something is wrong here. Actually, this might be hard to exploit in a where clause in this specific case. So when the timestamp is attacker supplied, so the attacker puts in some um, query tries to insert something that might not actually work because the where query part uh, in Drupal might sanitize this um, But you should still never do it and the correct way to actually do this is the condition API here where we clearly have the separation um, The name of the property we want to query and then there is a, a specific parameter for the user supplied value the timestamp in this case and then this is safe because the database API escapes it correctly and then the instructions sent to the database, the actual SQL query, escapes that data correctly. All right. What do we have here? So we want to extract content from a PDF and PHP is not actually good at that. So we want to use Apache Tika, which is a Java library. Um, we wrote this little function where we can specify where this library lives on our server. Um, it lives in opt Tika tkapp.jar and then we build a command and then we execute the command and this shell exec function that you see here it would just execute the command and then return the standard output well i guess that works any any problems anybody sees here right so the variables that we are passing to the command they are not escaped so you can have a remote code execution in your shell um, it's called shell injection. So in a, uh, if this URL that is coming in, this is coming from user data, um, then the attacker can execute, uh, for example, a second command. So let's imagine something from URL, something like this. So we specify some URL, but then they use the semicolon to execute a second command on bash, for example, to give me the contents of slash etc slash pass with the, where we have some user information there that should never be leaked from any server. So then this is executed together with Tika. Tika runs on this URL, whatever the URL is. Tika generates some output. Then a second command is executed, which also generates some output. So the output gets together in this parsed variable, and the parsed variable is returned. And not only did I, did I extract code from a PDF document, suddenly I also get the contents of this file on the server. So if an attacker can supply this URL, this is really dangerous. You have shell injection. They can execute arbitrary um, things on your server. How do we prevent that? PHP has a built-in function called escape shell arc for arguments. So um, whatever goes into that command needs to be escaped with escape shell arc, and then we are safe. So I'm not only doing this for the URL here, but I'm also doing it, it for the variable because it can't hurt. So the ticker lib path is also escaped. It probably doesn't have to be escaped because it pro it's provided by the developer. But what you want to do in, when you're writing Drupal code, you always want to have a defense in depth approach. So even if an attacker is able to inject something into the variable table and we get it out here, even then we would escape it so they wouldn't have a chance here. So that's always good to have a layered approach to your security that you're not protecting yourself in one place but in multiple places if it doesn't interfere with the operation of your Drupal site, of course. But in this case, it's totally fine to escape this um, static string and it will still work. 
And even better, maybe avoid using shell exec altogether. Maybe you can use Apache Tika as a service, send an HTTP request, and that is also much safer, and you can avoid that. So in Jackson's summarized, um, we look into page callbacks and everything that executes query or shell scripts. Typically, these are controllers or forms in Drupal 8. Um, we also look in API functions that are used in services. In Drupal 8, somebody would probably provide a service and do the shell exec there. So that's also a good uh, place to look. And whenever C concatenating strings instead of using placeholders, that's a very, very good indicator that either the command is vulnerable or the, S the SQL query is vulnerable. Um, so look for that. What do we have here? This is an access hook for hook um, taxonomy term access. And it forwards the, in the first um, if clause, it forwards the call to another static function, whatever. So this is actually real code as I saw in a, in a Drupal module. And then it checks um, if we get an access result allowed there, I'm also returning an access result allowed. Mm -hmm. So I think it looks correct. What, what could go wrong here? So we have this if, it looks, it looks a bit long. Yeah, I think it's, it's hard to recognize. Do we have any problem with the first if? I think we do, because we have an access result if bypass. So from the function, from the method below, you get an access result. And then you check if access result, but that will always be true. <laughs> the problem is if you just have if access result, that is an object in this case, right? So because uh, the, the things below, they return objects. So we have an object here, and of course an object always evaluates to true. Um, so uh, access will always be granted in this case. So always review your access hooks for that access results are used correctly. And for access checks, always use access re result is allowed. Another example, this was actually from the GraphQL module, <laughs> which I maintain, so I find security issues in my own modules. <clears throat> <laughs> so this happens. Um, so we have some resolve function and it loads some entity from somewhere. And then we have the same access result again by calling access on this entity. And the true parameter at the end means return it as an object. So I want to use it as an object because I need to add it to my casual dependency uh, tree here. That's the reason why I get it as object. And then I call if access result is forbidden, do nothing and otherwise return the entity. <sighs> this is also a problem because it's the access result is forbidden trap. That's what I call it. Um, in Drupal 8, the access result can have three states. So you have allowed, forbidden, but you have also neutral, as we have seen before already. And you have to call access result um, is allowed because is forbidden might return false or neutral results. So that's um, a bit, I think, a weakness of the Drupal um, access result API in Drupal 8. Um, and this was this is forbidden call was overlooked by very, three very senior um, developers in the GraphQL module, and which has recently found out about it. And what's the correct fix, which is called access result is allowed, because that takes into account the neutral result, which should also forbid access um, correctly. So it's important to familiarize yourself with the um, access API in Drupal 8 when you write this access code and make sure that the logic is correct. It even has this uh, quote in the documentation. Important note, you have to call is allowed when you want to know whether someone has access. Yep. The problem is the other, um, the other methods are also available and PHP Storm or Visual Studio Code, whatever editor you use, just auto-completes them for you so you might want to use them but don't always use is allowed. So access control summarized, um, we have to check the logic that we do in the access controllers and in hook entity access, which exists in Drupal 8 and in Drupal 7. And we need to check if the if conditions are correct. And whenever access result is loose, use this um, object, we should um, check for is allowed and no other methods call to determine access to get a Boolean out. The only uh, <coughs> right way to get a Boolean out of the access result is to call is allowed. Also, uh, cache context information can also be security critical, to, so make sure that you cache the correct things. You don't want to cache an unpublished node and then suddenly return it for um, users that shouldn't have access to unpublished nodes. Yeah, so also check that. Now some example for render arrays and cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting happens on output. So I'm switching now to the output side of reviewing. I typically would look into page controllers. They are generating outputs and tweak templates. And what an, an attacker is able to supply in this example is a script tag, so it would execute some JavaScript. And now I'm putting this JavaScript variable into a render array. What do you think? Is this 
Is this okay? Would an alert pop up pop up in Drupal 8 or, or do you think it is safe? So the answer is a bit complicated here. In Drupal 8 this is safe because the render system runs um, XSS filter admin uh, on it. So this is a very good um, improvement in Drupal 8 where um, all the markup that we are generating, all the things that we are outputting in Twig is auto escape by default. So we try to escape everything against this cross-site clipping attacks by default. But unfortunately in Drupal 7 it is, is, it is not safe because the render system just prints whatever there is. So whenever you have user provided uh, input and put it in markup tags or prefix tags, whatever, you have to be very uh, careful. This is the top um, seven um, vulnerability listed by the OVASP. So I encourage you to check that out. <coughs> Let's look at the uh, Twig template in this example. So Twig is usually very good. It, it does auto escaping on all the variables, but there is something in there which is actually an XSS vulnerability. It's already highlighted by the syntax highlighter here. And this is this little raw keyword. So whenever you review templates, check if a developer uses this raw um, keyword because it means auto escaping is disabled and the variable is rendered as is. So this would, would be a template uh, cross-site scripting vulnerability. So whenever you look at templates, check if they use the raw filter. How can you actually test for cross-site scripting? So I'm always using this alert XSS snippet. I put this in all inputs, in get parameters, whatever, and then I see if it's coming out of Drupal again. And if it's coming out, then I get this annoying JavaScript pop-up and I know ah, something is not escaped correctly. This is very helpful for Drupal 7 specifically, um, but it's also useful in Drupal 8. But Twig isn't perfect, right? If I'm doing something very stupid like this, so putting the node label, which is the node title, directly into this source attribute without using quotes, mm, that's not good because it bypasses auto-escaping uh, Actually, auto-escaping is happening, but it's not really helping here because the attacker can put in something like this. So they have this A. This A is then used as the source of the image. Of course, it doesn't load. So an error is thrown. So the browser executes the on error attribute, which would then open a pop-up. And this is just an example, but an attacker could provide some other JavaScript there. It's a bit tricky with the quotes, so the attacker would have to be very careful, but it's possible to have this. So make sure that you have the correct quotes in your templates. Um, don't, uh, don't forget them, because then the auto-escaping doesn't help you. The auto-escaping mostly helps you between HTML tags, but if you're working with attributes in HTML, you have to be a lot more careful um, what you're putting in there. And there is the OVASP um, cross-site scripting cheat sheet. I encourage you to check that out as well. It has some examples like this one, what people can put in attributes so that it can also trigger cross-site scripting. Oh yeah, yeah, that would then be the, the resolved version. Um, we have this as the node title and then this is injected into the template and this would be the image tag and then it, the pop-up would trigger. So cross-site scripting summarized, um, the auto-scaping is really good in Drupal 8. Be careful with the HTML attribute as I said. Uh, in Drupal 7 it's unfortunately a bit of a nightmare because you have to check so many things. Um, there could be cross-site scripting in the PHP templates, in the team functions, pre-process, in the callbacks where you are building um, this. But there's a good documentation page called Handle Text in a Secure Fashion. Um, I linked it here from the slides and I will post the slides later. Um, another vulnerability we had this year was the unserialize um, vulnerability that is executed on user provided data. So unserialize is used to make use take an array or an object and put it into a string so that you can send it over the network. And what is happening here even with get requests if you have the rest module and some rest resource enabled and this request is incoming then Drupal tries to deserialize that. An attacker would put an evil serialized payload in his options value, and then this would be, be deserialized. Um, and there was a vulnerability in core which just deserialized everything, and that's how it happened. And then you have remote code execution. Why do we have a remote code execution? You can take a look at some evil unserialized um, payload that would be supplied. So an attacker is specifying O, which means objects, and then some, some class in Drupal. In this case, it was something from the uh, Gustl project, which is a dependency of Drupal core. And this special class can, can hold some properties which execute arbitrary PHP code. And what an attacker does, they supply the pass-through path function, which is a PHP function, to just um, execute something on a shell, and then an evil command. In this case, it's very primitive. It's just echo hacked, so something happened. But of course, an attacker would put something more uh, severe in there. 
And then what Drupal does, it, um, or what it has done, it has been fixed in the meantime, it deserializes this, then we have this Gussel object, and then the Gussel object runs out of scope, then the PHP garbage collector runs, and then this object is destroyed, and when the object is destroyed, then this um, page call, uh, not this page call, but this shell command is executed, and that would be the remote code execution. I linked um, the, um, some exploit code also in the notes of these slides, how somebody um, abused that. So what do we learn from that? Um, we need to use unserialized correctly. This is not showing up that often in the in contributed modules that you see. But whenever data is coming in, um, we need to make sure that we call unserialized correctly. We can just disallow all classes because what is Drupal using serialized stuff with? Usually it's arrays. It's some option array that we have been seeing, some properties on the link. And then we don't need classes. We can just disable it and then unserialize is safe. Um, actually, unserializing stuff has been a vulnerability in many programming languages and frameworks, and that's why the OWASP classified also in the top 10 list, uh, ranking 8, insecure deserialization. We also have a vulnerability with um, XML entities. So if you're passing XML, you also have to be careful, because you can have special XML documents like this. And what we are doing here is it's called entity expansion, and this is part of the XML standard, which is yeah not good for internet applications. So um, what it's trying, what it's doing is, it's just um, commands that are then filling XML content. So in this case, it would read data from etc passwd and then fill it into this foo tags. And if the attacker gets back this XML somehow, right, they are sending the XML and you are outputting it somewhere or processing it, then it would contain the, the content of this file on the server, which an attacker shouldn't have access to. It's also um, on the OWASP top 10 list actually as number four. So um, what can you do in PHP about that? You would uh, disable the entity loader in the libxml library. So um, PHP is using the C library to, to pass XML and there you can just disable this and then this expansion just wouldn't work. It would just not expand anything and would just leave the content as is. And that's how you can deal with that. So it's actually a simple fix, but whenever you work with XML in PHP, you shouldn't forget it. All right, so this were just some examples. And what, so let's summarize what do I do on a full code review rundown. I check the entry points in the Drupal module as we had, routing files, module files, is there cross-site request forgery, what is happening in the module files. Then I check how is the module dealing with input. So on input, we always want to validate what is coming in. Um, that is usually done in controllers. Are they having some SQL injection vulnerabilities uh, with the input or deserializing vulnerabilities that we saw? And in the end, I, I check where the data is coming out of the module again, it rendered into templates or something else, checking for cross-site scripting there. Important is to check also the access control. This is usually done in Drupal plugins, hooks, whatever. Um, and then I always make sure to read through the rest to understand completely what the module is doing. And what you should always do when reviewing, you should get into the attacker mindset. How could the code be abused? What could go wrong with this code? And um, security professionals, they always recognize security as a process. So code review is only one small part of everything that should, you should do. The easiest thing that you need to do is just keeping your software components up to date because there are known vulnerabilities and we all use Drupal, we all use existing contrib modules. Just updating them helps you to keep that secure. We need to make sure that everybody is aware and trained for security. So we want to deploy a defense in depth um, approach that we secure our server, our Drupal code, our custom modules, and also the people. People shouldn't fall um, for social engineering attacks where somebody calls and says, please give me your password. Yeah, don't do that. People should be aware of that. And then code review is part of the quality assurance thing with testing where we try to prevent security vulnerabilities, but you should also have a plan in case anything happens. The good frameworks, what you can do on incident response when a Drupal site is hacked, what you need to do, having backups in place. And then you can also have penetration tests where you get some external company to validate your code. Some resources I have, there is the OWASP code re uh, re review guide. It's fairly long. I think it's a really long uh, document. It's a lot of words. I don't particularly like it. It's just too much te text for me. But I think it's a good framework to understand, like even from the outline, what you can do in code review. The OWASP top 10 security risk I already mentioned. There was also a session at the Drupal Con, so watch the recording from that one. In Drupal 8, we have documentation about writing secure code, so it's also important for every developer to understand that. And what I like to work with are this, 
Drupal security coverage applications where we review modules of new contributors that want to get security coverage for their modules. And um, I'm reviewing modules there. If you want to know, learn more about there, there's also a link. And with that, that's it. Any questions? So there's a microphone, we should try to get it on the recording. So if anybody, oh, I can also repeat the question, so. Yeah, there in the back. There's something I think I missed from your talk, it's customary testing. Because uh, the access check should be, uh, should be called by many tests. Yes, absolutely. So code review is only one part, right? With code review, you can just find stuff that has not been covered by the tests or where the tests might actually be wrong. Right. So, um, yes, automated tests should also check for security. That's very important so that you test for scenarios um, which could be abused by attackers. So what people t usually often test is the happy path. They test something, they save a node and then the node shows up. OK, but they don't test the thing where they put in some dangerous stuff in the node title and what is then showing up. And sometimes people don't think of all the possibilities, what can go wrong with the module or the code. And then they don't catch it with automated tests. And that is actually so I think these are both sides of quality assurance that you need to do. Peer review is one side to, to get the perspective of a human, and automated test is something to ensure what the developer wrote is actually correct. Yeah. So the code review is validating what the developer did from external standpoint, and automated tests is developer making sure herself that what she did is actually correct. Yeah. Yes? Uh, yeah. Um... Quite a few of these are probably repeating all the time, everywhere. Yeah. So can these be, or are they including checks against this in, in any of the coding linters or any that kind of tool? Yeah, so the question was um, if we can automatically detect these common vulnerabilities that I just shown in those examples. The question is we don't really have something like that. So I'm also the maintainer of the Coda library which is checking for coding standards, and we have something in there called Drupal Practice. So this is a scanner which tries to give you hints on what you might be doing wrong in your code, but it's just, it's a static analyzer, so it doesn't have the full information what is actually going on. And especially that's a problem in Drupal 8 where you have uh, complex uh, object dependencies and you might not know what the method call actually means and if this is a bad method call and people sh should do something else. But since we wrote libraries uh, such as Drupal Check, where we check for deprecated APIs, and I think that is using some other PHP parsing library. Um, we should be able to write something similar where we can check um, YAML files, for example. Is there an underscore access um, true property in there? And then maybe throw a warning. Yeah, we could do that. But I, I think no such library exists at the moment. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah. you again. <laughs> <laughs> Injection example uh, you gave. Um, you uh, trusted the, the, the SPL API or, uh, to, to, to clean the, the input. But should we trust on, on such APIs? Or, uh, myself, I always try, for example, if I expect an integer, I, I either clean it or check. Yes. Yes. So um, that's a very, very good point. So the question was, can we trust the Drupal database API? And if I have an integer, if I know it should be an integer, I can just cast it to an integer, for example. So I think you should actually do both. Um, the API, um, I think you need to understand what kind of stuff you can pass to the API and just never use string concatenation. That's the basic rule for the database API. But in principle, you can trust it, right? That's also the goal of the database API, that it is a tool for the developer that is actually secure. This is very important that this tool is secure. Yeah. And regarding the integers, I think you can do it on top. So if you're passing uh, in a condition an integer, you can also cast it to integer. It doesn't hurt. And it's clear for a reviewer also that this must always be an integer. So I think it gives a lot of additional clues. So I would recommend it. Yeah. Anyone else? I have, I have a bonus slide. <laughs> so yeah, this was actually from another talk I gave this year. Uh, also with PHP itself, you can have uh, a couple of nasty problems. Um, in this case, we have an access bypass because of a typo. 
the simplex highlighting basically gives it away already, mm. but uh, in this case we have some security function which checks a key. So the first if condition, so if it's not 32 characters, it returns false. Okay, yeah, that looks correct. In the second case, it trims the shared key, and if it equals the, the empty string, it returns something. But it's not returning false, it's returning flasse. So this was a typical <laughs> typo that, that some developer did, and then this led to some um, um, privilege escalation vulnerability. I also linked this in the, in the notes of this talk. Um, so what, what would have an attacker to send in here? So I can send in 32 white spaces, right? If I send in 32 white spaces, it will pass the first one, <laughs> and then it will go to the second one, and it will be the empty string, okay? And then it will return flasse, and if somebody calls this function and does not strictly check what is coming out of this function, I mean, PHP will give a warning. It will say, there's some undefined constant here, but PHP doesn't care. It will just happily continue on and return this string. And if somebody is not doing a strict comparison with the result of this function, then I can elevate my access. What can we do about that? Um, we can do PHP type hinting as a security protection. So I'm, I'm a big fan of that, yeah. Um, static types everywhere. Um, so we can put in a, a return type hint bool. So the only thing that it is allowed to come out of this function is either true or false. We have to enable strict types um, for this to actually work to draw a fatal error. So whenever, whenever you're working with this type hinting, I would recommend that you enable strict type for your PHP files. And this is not the Drupal um, core standard because we're not doing it in Drupal yet. But for every code that you write, for example, for custom modules or even for contributed modules, you can say, I depend on PHP 7 and I actually require this. Um, then you can do that. And then it will result in a, in a type error that the return value of the function is a string instead of a boolean and your code will not continue. Your site will break, right? So the attacker will get a white screen. Um, but at least um, they didn't escalate the access and can exploit something uh, in the site. Yeah. So I would uh, recommend that. We should also push for that in Drupal Core so that we adopt this at some point, that we have more type hints. Because it, this does not only reveal security issues in your code, it also reveals type problems or other problems that you might have um, overlooked. Okay. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, yeah you mentioned that um, Drupal uh, by default um, enables uh, cross-site uh, 334 forms. Yeah. And that is all for authenticated. Yes. So the question was, what do we have? More? Yeah, uh, what's your stand po uh, your point on uh, for anonymous uh, users for mm -hmm. forms? So for um, cross site, the question was cross site request forgery on forms only works for authenticated users, but not for anonymous users. And this is um, um, a bit by design in Drupal, or how Drupal understands this is this: an anonymous, you cannot distinguish anonymous users between each other, so you don't actually know from whom the uh, request is coming from. So the security tokens that we generate in the form would be the same for each anonymous user. So an attacker can just copy their security token and do something on the behalf of the anonymous user. So whenever you want to protect anonymous users, you either have to start a session or lock them in. Yeah, that's the reason for that, because an attacker has the same access as every anonymous user to the, to the um, tokens that come out of the form, so they can copy it and then do something on behalf of the user. And sometimes you get a security scan from an automated tool yes. and that, that comes up yes. as it's a vulnerability. Yes, <laughs> so the comment was that automated um, security testing tools report this as vulnerability yeah. in their reports and that's obviously not good. I wonder if we have um, if we have some documentation on Drupal.org, I'm not sure why, maybe we have something. Yeah, we should be able to look this up or we should write it. We should write down on Drupal. Drupal doesn't do cross-site request for free protection for anonymous users because we cannot distinguish them and because our protection with the token is based on sessions. That's why we can't do it. And anonymous user doesn't have a session, so. <coughs> Any more questions? All right. Thanks, everybody.